care for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone good afternoon it's always nice to see so many doctors especially uh, when you're joining a lecture on a public holiday uh, i would first like to thank uh, nilesh and his team at hemas for inviting me for this uh, and also for organizing this because it's not easy to get so many the message across uh, all all across sri lanka in the next quarter of an hour or so i'm hoping to talk to you about surgical infections that you might encounter as first contact doctors and this is going to be there's going to be a particular focus on managing the infection rather than the surgical aspect of the disease the antibiotic recommendations i use are from the guidelines of the sri lanka college of microbiologists and the nice guidelines of uk i have no conflicts of interest regarding this topic and this is the overview of my talk so i'll talk about skin and subcutaneous infections uh, infections in the gi tract infections related to the breast and some gu infections that you might encounter as a first contact doctor uh i see a chat message uh, saying they can't see the slides can others see the slides yes okay yes okay yes. fine okay so i'll progress there might be an individual who's having a problem okay so uh, moving on so when it comes to skin and subcutaneous infections i'll be touching upon cellulitis and erysipelas infections accompanying a leg ulcer diabetic foot infections human and animal bites and infections in the hand and the fingers uh, i'm happy to answer any questions uh, throughout the presentation but it might disrupt the flow so if there are any questions uh, you can put it in the chat box and i can take it up when it's appropriate or uh, i'm sure there'll be time at the end of my talk for me to discuss any questions you have so cellulitis and erysipelas um, i'm sure most of you see more cellulitis in your practice than i do in mine but what's the difference between cellulitis and erysipelas this is erysipelas on your left hand side and cellulitis on the right So the difference is in the layers or the depth of involvement. So cellulitis extends from the epider epidermis through the dermis and up to the subcutaneous tissue. Remember, it doesn't involve the fascia. Erysipelas, on the other hand, is confined to the epidermis and the superficial dermis. This is why erysipelas has a very clear demarcation. and almost palpable demarcation compared to cellulitis which has a vague border between the involved and the uninvolved tissue the second difference is going to be is cellulitis can can be with or without purulence or pus whereas erysipelas is always non purulent most patients with cellulitis will have an uncomplicated course and can be safely managed in the community with oral antibiotics there are several situations and several considerations that you must have when you're treating a patient with cellulitis first of all is it severe or is it mild what's the site of infection because facial cellulitis is very different to cellulitis of a limb especially an infection around the eyes or the nose and is there a risk of uncommon pathogens remember if you remember your anatomy there are veins that join from between uh, that communicate between the face and the cavernous sinus so any infection in this danger triangle can spread intracranially and cause infection or thrombosis in the cavernous sinus 
So if you see a patient with periorbital cellulitis or facial cellulitis, it's best that they're referred to a hospital. When it comes to antibiotics for the mild episode of cellulitis, you can use flucloxacillin or cephalexin. If the patient is allergic, you can use clarithromycin, erythromycin, or doxycycline. These are antibiotics recommended in guidelines worldwide. If there is severe infection, or if, you, if the cellulitis is periorbital or facial, then you need a stronger antibiotic. So your option will be comoxiclar, kefiroxin, moxifloxacin, and clindamycin. It is equally important to mark the extent of the infection. And I'll tell you why. Prescribing antibiotics for a patient with cellulitis is only part of the management. The advice you give your patient is equally or perhaps even more important than your antibiotics. You need to warn the patients about the side effects of antibiotics, especially if you're using something like erythromycin, which causes GI side effects, or coamoxiclav, which is prone to give diarrhea. So if you don't warn your patients beforehand, they are going to think they have an allergy or a reaction to these antibiotics, and they're going to stop. Their compliance is going to be poor. The second thing you need to tell your patients, which I routinely tell my patients, is that they need to keep the limb elevated. I always tell my patients that antibiotics only work against bacteria. It does nothing for the swelling. Unless the patient keeps the leg elevated, whether they're in bed or when they're seated, that swelling is not going to go away. The third thing you need to tell is the skin will take time to return to normal. That does not mean the infection is going on. Full resolution, even at five to seven days, is not expected in everyone. Sometimes patients come back to you after a week saying, I completed the antibiotics, but my redness or the swelling is still there. That doesn't necessarily indicate the cellulitis is, on, is still there. So you need to ensure them or reassure them that the changes in the subcutaneous tissue will take time to settle. The most important thing you need to tell your patients is that they need to come back and see you if they develop any of these features. With antibiotics, we expect things to settle or start to settle within two to three days. If it doesn't happen, they need to come back. If they feel very unwell, if they develop severe pain, or if the redness or the swelling goes beyond the initial presentation, which is why you marked it on the skin, they need to come back and see you because these might indicate a complication. On the other hand, if the patient has any of these features when they come and see you, it's better that they be managed in a hospital. If they have any symptoms or signs, that might indicate a more serious illness like orbital cellulitis, osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, necrotizing fasciitis, or they're systemically unwell and septic, they need to be admitted. Remember, septic arthritis, osteomyelitis can always have uh, an ongoing cellulitis with the underlying pathology. So they need to be referred to a hospital. If the patient is severely unwell, or if they have lymphangitis, then again, they need to be referred. If you're suspecting an uncommon pathogen, for example, if this injury was in, while the patient was at a beach, if it was a salt water injury, or if it's an agricultural injury, they also need specialist management. If the spread of antibiotics is not responding to oral antibiotics, or if the patient cannot take oral antibiotics for whatever reason, they need to be referred to the nearest hospital. 
In a patient who presents with a painful, painful swelling of a limb, if it looks like this, it's obvious that it's not cellulitis, but often it's not that clear. If there is discoloration like this, blistering, if the patient has fever, if the pain is disproportionate to your findings, that is always a situation where you should suspect a necrotizing fasciitis, especially if the patient is becoming progressively unwell. The second thing that might mimic a cellulitis is deep vein thrombosis, especially if it's in the upper limb, if the patient has no diabetes, has no risk factors or no injury, and if there is no sign of infection or minimal signs of inflammation, you might do a full blood count and that might be normal. You might do a CRP, which again might be normal. That is the time to suspect a deep vein thrombosis, especially if patients come with upper limb swelling. I've seen several patients who've had upper limb DVD being misdiagnosed as cellulitis. So that's one other thing to suspect. So what do you do for recurrent cellulitis? If a patient develops or has developed more than three episodes a year, especially they have a predisposing condition like diabetes or chronic lymphedema, they will need antibiotic prophylaxis. Generally, this is going to be oral penicillin twice a day or erythromycin twice a day. The need to continue antibiotics has to be reviewed every six months to one year. In patients that I treat for recurrent cellulitis, I give them the same advice I give my diabetic patients about foot hygiene. They need to keep their feet clean. They need to wash it daily in the evening with lukewarm water, paying particular attention to the spaces in between the toes and pat the foot dry, including those web spaces to prevent a fungal infection. Uh, the second thing is if they have any issues with limited mobility or poor eyesight, they need to get, uh, get help from another person to look at their feet because these little things will matter and in preventing cellulitis and foot sepsis. Uh, I see a question in the chat box. This is probably to be answered by the HEMAS uh, team. They've asked whether they can get the recording of the webinar after the lecture. Uh, I'll uh, let them, uh, Nilesh, you can maybe contact them separately later on. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. We'll be recording the session and definitely we will uh, give you the recording. Okay. Thanks, Nilesh. So moving on to infections in leg ulcers, the first thing you must remember is only a few leg ulcers are actually clinically infected. Most ulcers are only colonized. And in patients who only have colonization of their ulcers, antibiotics are not going to promote healing. But how do you know that it's infected? Simple. If they have redness or swelling, that spreads beyond the ulcer, if there is localized warmth, pain, or fever, that, be, that indicates an ongoing infection. When you're prescribing antibiotics for these patients, you need to consider the severity and of the symptoms and the signs, the risk of complications these, may, these patients may have, and their previous use of antibiotics. Here again, the recommendation from guidelines for as the first choice is fluclocicillin. If the patient is allergic to a penicillin, you may use doxycycline, clarithromycin, or erythromycin. The second choice is going to be comoxiclav or moxifloxacin or cotrimoxazole. Again, you need to advise your patients. Come back and see you if they don't see any improvement in the next two to three days, or if they become unwell or develop pain 
out of proportion to the infection. And you need to tell them, like your cellulitis patients, that full resolution will take time. And just because they've finished the course of antibiotics does not mean that uh, it has not settled. And if at the time of seeing you, they have any of these features, they need to be referred to a hospital. All of these indicate either an existing complication or a potential for a very complicated course. So if there are symptoms or signs of a more serious illness, like sepsis, necrotizing fasciitis, or osteomyelitis, they need to be hospitalized. They have a higher risk of complications due to their comorbidities like poorly controlled diabetes, ischemia, peripheral vascular disease, or uh, chronic lymphedema. If they have lymphangitis, indicating that the infection is spreading, or it's not spread, if it's spreading despite your antibiotics, or if they cannot take oral antibiotics, they need to come to a hospital. I'm sure all of you must be seeing patients with diabetic foot problems. So here again, remember, in diabetes, all wounds are likely to be colonized, but not infected. Infection is suspected if a patient has two or more of these features, warmth, tenderness or pain, erythema, swelling or induration, or a purulent discharge. Basically, any medical student will tell you the features of acute inflammation. So if anybody with a diabetic foot problem has features of acute inflammation, suspect an infection. So once you diagnose an infection, the next thing to do is to assess the severity. Generally, it's considered a mild infection if the extent of erythema is less than two centimeters from the edge of the ulcer. It's, consider it's considered moderate if the infection is more than two centimeters or you think it involves deeper structures. For example, a concomitant abscess or osteomyelitis septic arthritis or necrotizing fasciitis. It's considered severe if the patient has systemic features of inflammation, fever, tachycardia, a low blood pressure, maybe even tachypnea, that indicates a severe infection. Why is the severity scale important? Well, it tells you the modality of administration of antibiotics. If it's, mild infection, if it's mild infection, you can manage them on oral antibiotics. Moderate infection may be managed with either oral or IV, depending on what you feel the patient's condition is. CV infections will always require IV antibiotics. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, there's an issue with the slides, I think. Uh, is the slides are vis for me, it's visible. Yeah. Is there an issue of uh, seeing the slides? Others, can you, does anyone reply with them? I think several others also said they can see the slides when I asked them. Yeah, or I think it's uh, it's because of the network issues you all have, I think. Uh, we'll try to manage that. Yeah. I think it's clear. Okay, and sorry, uh, also the recording yeah. will be available. Uh, so yes. if uh, there is any issue, uh, don't worry about the slides. Uh, it will be available to you later. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. So uh, moving on to antibiotics. Again, it depends on the severity. Well, it depends on what you're thinking is the situation. Your options or the first choice is going to be fucloxacillin or coamoxiclab. These are what guidelines recommend. If your practice there differs from that, I'm, I'm happy for you to go ahead with your experience. Uh, if the patient is allergic to a penicillin, or if you think this is unsuitable, your options are going to be clarithromycin, erythromycin, or clindamycin, moxifloxacin, or doxycycline. Remember, patients with diabetes are likely to get infections, likely to get recurrent infections. So always try to use the 
smallest or the least aggressive antibiotic because you will then have space to escalate. Uh, there's a question about flucloxacin adding to comoxiclav. Uh, no, I don't think there is an advantage because comoxiclav, the main advantage or action of flucloxacin is flucloxacin is against uh, Staphylococcus aureus, and comoxiclav has uh, an uh, effective Staphylococcus aureus cover. So I don't think there's an added advantage of combining those two. But uh, if you have a culture report that shows different uh, organisms which may require different or combined antibiotics, that might be the situation. Okay. And uh, again, your antibiotics only go as far as the instructions and the compliance of the patient. So advise the patients about the adverse effect or side effects and when to come and see you, like symptoms worsening or not improving within one to two days. If when you see a patient with a diabetic foot ulcer, if they have any of these complications or symptoms, refer them to a hospital immediately. If they have fever or sepsis with ulceration, if there's ischemia, it's always important that you feel for the foot ulcers when a patient comes with an ulcer, so if they have ischemia with or indicated by absent foot pulsers, or if they have intermittent claudication in their history, that's the time to refer them. If you're suspecting a deep-seated soft tissue or bone infection, necrotizing fasciitis, osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, that again is a time to refer them. Or if they have toe gangrene or birth an ascending gangrene. Remember, patients with diabetes and diabetic foot problems need a multidisciplinary approach. So once you've diagnosed and managed an infection, even if they don't have any indications for an immediate referral to a hospital or a specialist, refer them electively so that they can be assessed and advised. Uh, there's a question about cloxicillin. Uh, um, I assume it's referring to the previous slide. So yes, flucloxacillin and cloxacillin can be used uh, if, if uh, you're using cloxacillin. Flu I understand flucloxacillin is expensive. So cloxacillin can be used. It has very similar effect for all practical purposes. Moving on to human and animal bites. Well, some, when, somebody, uh, when a patient comes to you with a bite, you need to assess the type of the bite and the severity of the bite. What animal or human caused the bite? What's the site and the depth of the wound? And is it infected? It's also very important that you assess the risk of tetanus, rabies, and in the case of human bites, other bloodborne viral infections uh, when you see a patient with, uh, a, with a bite wound. The first thing to do is to manage the wound. And that includes copious irrigation and depending on the situation, uh, debriding the wound. Remember, you can never over irrigate a wound. There are going to be micro, uh, bacteria and other debris de in the depths of that wound and a proper irrigation will save you a lot of problems, including abscess formation and ongoing infection. Also, be very mindful about abuse, especially in children and in vulnerable groups. When it comes to the antibiotic prophylaxis for an uninfected wound, remember if the wound is infected, you have to give antibiotics. If the wound is not infected, and if you're considering prophylactic antibiotics, these are the things you need to consider. First of all, what's the type of a bite? Type of the bite, whether it's human or animal, or the, and the type of the animal. And whether it has not broken the skin, like picture on the left, it's a bit of bruising, but no injury to the epidermis. Or if it has broken the skin, 
but not drawn blood, like the middle picture, or when the bride has broken the skin and drawn blood. Well, if it's a human bite, and if it has not broken the skin, you don't need to prescribe antibiotics. If it's a picture like the one on the left, young female coming to you a few days after honeymoon, no need of antibiotics. Those bite marks will just settle. If the bite has broken skin, but not, bro not drawn blood, you may consider antibiotics. If it's a high risk area, uh, it's a delicate skin, or if the patient is at high risk, a poorly controlled diabetic or lymphedema, that's the time to give them prophylactic antibiotics. If the bite has broken skin and drawn blood, you need to offer them antibiotics. The picture on the right of a bite mark on the knuckle is a fight bite or a punch bite where somebody has punched a person in the face and the person receiving the punch had the mouth open and that's a mark of a tree. These can be very dangerous because they directly almost always go into the metacarpophalangeal joint and the patient is at high risk of septic arthritis. If somebody comes with a wound like this, always ask them whether it was a punch bite or a fight bite and manage them appropriately. Coming to animal bites, whether it's a cat bite or a dog bite, if it has not broken skin, just like human bites, you don't need to give them antibiotics. If the bite has broken the skin, but not drawn blood, you may consider antibiotics in cat bites, but not in dogs. If the bite has broken the skin and drawn blood, that is a time to prescribe antibiotics. What antibiotics do you prescribe? But the first choice is going to be comoxiclam. If the allergic to penicillins or unsuitable, or comoxiclam is unsuitable for whatever reason, some people have developed gastritis of comoxiclam, which is very unusual, but I've seen quite a few patients who complain of this. Then your options are going to be doxycycline and metronidazole. You always advise them that they need to seek medical advice if the infection worsens rapidly or significantly at any time, does not start to improve within 24 to 48 hours, patient becomes systemically unwell, or the patient develops pain that is out of proportion to the infection. All of these indicate a worsening infection or the patient developing a complication. Remember whether it's, whether it's cellulitis, diabetic foot infection, infection in an ulcer or a bite, the advice is the same. They need to come and see you again in a few days if it doesn't settle or if there are features of complications. Moving on to hand and finger infections. These are again common situations that patients might come and seek your advice. The picture on the left is an abscess in the finger. The one in the middle is a eponychia and one on the right is a paronychia. When a patient comes with an infection in the hand and fingers, always suspect the presence of a foreign body, especially if it's an old injury which has failed to settle or kept on getting worse. Patient will not remember or not even understand the possibility of a foreign body. If there is an abscess, that needs draining. No amount of antibiotics is going to help you uh, or help the patient uh, settle an abscess. If there is cellulitis, then you can start an antibiotic. And your options will be cephalexine, fluoxetine, or comoxiclam. And uh, you can even use floxacillin depending on the situation. May, uh, patients like this, especially depending on the injury, may need tetanus prophylaxis. And splinting and elevation is going to help a lot with the pain on top of your analgesia 
So always choose or decide whether the patient needs splinting as well, and always advise them about elevation. Uh, there's a question about comoxiclav having anaerobic effect. For all mild and moderate infections, including intra-abdominal infections and GI infections, uh, which I'll discuss in a uh, which I'll discuss a bit later, comoxiclav the cover the uh, anaerobic cover of comoxiclav is sufficient for practical purposes. If you're suspecting a, a primarily anaerobic infection then yes, of course, go ahead for uh, another antibiotic or an additional antibiotic. A few things again, like necrotizing fasciitis and DVT while you're treating cellulitis, to look out for when you're treating antibiotics, uh, antibiotics for hand infections would be pulpitis infections, flexor sheath infections, and septic arthritis. Pulp space infections are particularly important because of this anatomical arrangement. There are tight septae that span between the subcutaneous or the skin up to the uh, periosteum of the terminal phalanx. Any infection or abscess in any of these spaces is going to increase the, sp increase the pressure in this area and compromise the vascular supply to the terminal phalanx. So if you're suspecting a pulp space infection, that patient needs an incision and drainage immediately. If a patient comes like this, where there is swelling of the finger, the finger is partially flexed, there is fullness around the tendon sheath, suspect a flexor sheath infection. These are dangerous because of a number of reasons. A, they can spread distally towards the finger. They can spread proximally towards the palm. And once they've spread proximally, they can spread into the other flexor sheets because of the common anatomy. And they can even spread towards the forearm. So if you see a patient like this, start them on antibiotics and send them to hospital immediately. The third situation I mentioned previously is going to be like I mentioned previously, is going to be septic arthritis. Always have a high suspicion of septic arthritis in anybody who comes with cellulitis over a joint or a bone. Okay. Uh, are there any questions about the management of soft tissue infections? Otherwise, I'll move into GI infections. Okay, uh, if there are any questions, you can put it in the chat and or you can ask later. Moving on to GI infections. Uh, the topics I'm going to cover include oral candidiasis, uh, infectious diarrhea, uh, helicobacter pylori, and acute diverticulitis. If you see a patient with oral candidiasis, the first thing to suspect or think about is, is this patient having an undiagnosed immunocompromised state? Because oral candidiasis is rare in immunocompetent adults. Always suspect the presence of an underlying undiagnosed condition, including HIV, in somebody that you see with oral candidiasis. When you're treating them, azoles are going to be more effective than nystatin. So a good option is mechanosol gel four times a day. And you can advise the patient to hold it in their mouth after each meal. Usually they need treatment for about seven days plus seven days after the resolution, a total of about 14 days. If mechanosol is not tolerated for any reason, the options are going to be nystatin four times a day for a total of about nine days. If it is extensive or severe, you can use fluconazole for two weeks. 
in most patients with diarrhea, antibiotic therapy is not indicated unless the patient is systemically unwell. The general principles of management of a diarrheal episode is going to be the assessment of and management of hydration. And that is in the form of oral rehydration solution. As a rule of thumb, if the patient has a watery diarrhea, they do not need antibiotics except cholera. If the patient, on the other hand, comes with a bloody diarrhea, they need antibiotics. So how do you rehydrate the patient with ORS? Well, it's simple. It depends on the degree of hypovolemia. If the patient has no features of hypovolemia, like sunken eyes in a child, absence of tears in a child, dry mouth, a coat and tongue, a tongue, thirst, and decreased skin turgor, you can advise them to take ORS after each stool, and they can take about two liters a day. It's best that you re reassess them periodically, so you can ask them to come back if they don't feel well. If they have some degree of hypovolemia, you can give them two to four liters of ORS in the first four hours. And you can reassess them and also advise them to take ORS which, with each diarrheal stool. If they have severe hypovolemia, they need IV fluid and need to be hospitalized. When it comes to the antibiotics, it primarily depends on what pathogen you suspect. So if you're suspecting Shigella, uh, the patient comes with fever, abdominal cramps, and may have a mucoid or a bloody diarrhea, your options are going to be ciprofloxacin and azithromycin. If you think this might be amoebic dysentery, uh, the presentation is subacute, the drug of choice is going to be metronidazole. If you think it might be Campylobacter, uh, it is un, un, there, there is uh, exposure to undercooked meat, there is abdominal pain, and the patient is, systemat is, is systemically unwell, you can use clarithromycin. If a patient, if you're trying to prevent traveler's diarrhea in somebody who is traveling to a high risk area, or if they're at a high risk of severe disease, the recommendation is to use azithromycin prophylactically. Uh, I included H. pylori for the sake of completion. Yes, sir. Sorry, yes. Sir, I think we have uh, questions on the chat, but uh, shall uh, we do uh, Yeah, well, I'll take, okay. So since, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll take them up uh, now before I move to a different section. Thanks. Uh, okay. So if the, there are a few questions. So if cellulitis is not responding to antibiotics, well, it depends. Generally, if it's not responding, but the two logical options are either the antibiotic is not working or your diagnosis is wrong. Assuming your diagnosis is right, you can, if you've started them on fluoxetine or cephalexin, you can move to something like coamoxiclab or uh, uh, ciprofloxacin or moxifloxacin and see whether it works. Assuming the patient is not systemically unwell and it's a mild episode. Because if it's not uh, settling, it may indicate that there's something ongoing deeper uh, and worse than cellulitis. Uh, there is a question about pulse phase infection and the direction of incision. Well, there are two, in, uh, two incisions that you can place. One is going to be on the pulp phase. You can see my finger. You can place it on the pulp, sort of in the axia, uh, on the palm aspect of the finger. The second thing is going to be on the side parallel to the surface, but about five centimeters, five millimeters away from the distal edge of the nail bed. Uh, there's a question about using polymyxin. Well, that is sort of a last resort to be used in uh, uh, different situations. Uh, I, I'll 
I don't recommend using that, neither do any of the guidelines, because it has to be used in specialty situations. If you have a patient who require, who you think requires something like polymyxin, they should not be managed as an outpatient. They require inpatient care. So I do not recommend using things like polymyxin. Pivmesilinam, uh, again, not in the guidelines that I have seen, uh, but if you have seen a guideline that recommends pivmesilinam, you can go ahead. Uh, when do you do an IND of the pulp stress infections? Well, if you suspect it, you deal with it. Uh, you do an IND because leaving uh, what the patient will end up is a small incision. If you don't file pus, that's fine. It will heal, heal in a few days. It's a ring block. It can be done very quickly. And uh, uh, it's far worse to miss a pulp stress infection than to do an unnecessary IND. So always err on the side of caution and do an IND if you suspect a pulse phase infection. Uh, needle irrigation without scalpel, no. I don't recommend that because you can never drain an abscess, especially in the pulp phase where you have so many cavities which are separated. You cannot deal, you cannot do a sufficient drainage without uh, a proper IND. Uh, place of probiotics, well, yes and no, uh, not certainly not intervention, uh, but management wise, especially if the patient may develop an antibiotic associated diarrhea, yes, probiotics. Uh, maybe we can take it up later because uh, I think we are falling behind the schedule. Uh, okay, last question I'm going to take on the chat uh, for this uh, uh, next 15 minutes. Uh, can we diagnose osteomyelitis clinically? Yes, if you suspect uh, if there is an abscess, if there is pus exuding, or if there's tenderness in an area where there's an injury that may have extended to the bone, that is a time to die, suspect osteomyelitis and time to do an x-ray to confirm or exclude. If you always are on the side of caution when you're thinking about complications, Okay, so when you see a patient with diverticular disease, you need to understand with aging, a majority or a significant number will develop diverticular in their colon. The presence of diverticular or diverticulosis is not symptomatic and does not require treatment. about 10 to 15% of patients with diverticular disease will develop complications. For example, diverticulitis or a diverticular bleed. And that is the time they need treatment. So, like I said, the presence of diverticular or diverticulosis does not require antibiotics. If the patient comes with acute diverticulitis indicated by pain, especially in the left iliac fossa, tenderness, but the patient is systemically well, you may not even give antibiotics. If the patient is systemically unwell, if they have fever, tachycardia, if the patient has fever, tachycardia, then certainly they need antibiotics. If at the extreme of the spectrum, if, they, if you're suspecting a complication, perforated diverticulitis, an abscess, or a bleed, then they need to be referred to a hospital for intravenous antibiotics. The first choice for uncomplicated diverticulitis is coamoxicla. If this is unsuitable or the patient is allergic, you can use cephalexine, cotrim plus metronidazole, or ciprofloxacine or moxifloxacine plus metronidazole. If they have a complicated course, they're most likely going to need IV antibiotics, which are going to be a combination of these antibiotics plus the addition of gentamicin. 
So if you're suspecting a complication, please refer them to a hospital for definitive management, including further investigations. And you need to advise your patients. So you need to advise, you need to advise your patients about their lifestyle and diet. They need to have a healthy, balanced diet, which includes lots of fruits, vegetables, and fiber. And when you're recommending this, remember, they need to have a sufficient body intake. Otherwise, that fiber is going to lead to, uh, to constipation. There's not enough water intake. And like any other patient, advise them on exercise, weight loss, and stopping smoking, all of which can cause constipation. You also need to educate them about the cause of the disease and the likelihood of progression. They need to know about the symptoms and how they can manage. Because remember, it's not going to, diverticular disease is not going to be cured with your treatment. So it's a matter of controlling it and controlling the symptoms. That's where avoiding constipation comes in because that will stop worsening of diverticular disease. Patients can take paracetamol for their pain and bulk forming laxatives for constipation. I always educate my patients about symptoms that may indicate complications or progression. If they have ongoing constipation, they need to come and see a doctor because that constipation is going to worsen their diverticular disease. In addition, I tell them if you develop severe pain, fever, uh, if you feel unwell, cannot eat, please come and see a doctor because that may indicate a diverticular a diverticulitis, a perforation or an abscess. Especially in the elderly, don't expect them to develop abdominal symptoms and signs because the presentations will be different. Uh, Okay, uh, there's a question about surgery in diverticulitis. So surgery is indicated either in complicated diverticulitis, which cannot or will not settle with conservative management. For example, perforated abscesses, uh, intraabdominal sepsis uh, will require surgery. If the patient gets three or more exacerbations of diverticulitis or bleed, that is an indication to uh, for a colectomy. Or if there is an intractable diverticular bleed, which does not respond to uh, conservative or interventional radiology methods. Otherwise, we generally do not treat uh, diverticulitis, uh, diverticul diverticular disease with surgery. Uh, moving on to uh, mastitis. Uh, if you have a patient especially a lactating mother coming to you with a painful breast, complaining of fever and malaise. And when you examine them, you find a tender red breast that indicates mastitis and you need to treat them accordingly. Most of these patients, like I said, will be lactating mothers. Most oral antibiotics we use are safe in breastfeeding. And you always need to advise them to continue lactating from the affected side. And if they cannot lactate from that side, for whatever reason, they need to express milk and discard it or feed. If they do not feed or manually express milk from that side, the infection is going to propagate and they're going to get a worse, they're going to be in a worse off situation than they began with. Staphylococcus aureus is the most common infecting pathogen in lactational mastitis. Well, what antibiotics can you use? Flucloxacillin, erythromycin, and clarithromycin, and coamoxiclav can all be used in lactational mastitis. Uh, in mastitis and also in lactational mastitis, unless there are special situations. And generally, you need to prescribe them for 10 to 14 days. If you have a patient with a breast abscess, they need a surgical referral. 
What do we do when we get a patient with a breast abscess? We examine them to confirm or exclude an abscess and also do an ultrasound scan to confirm and locate the abscess. The mainstay of management is going to be a needle aspiration. This may be done under clinical guidance with palpation or with ultrasound guidance. This aspiration is going to be both therapeutic as well as giving you a specimen for microbiological analysis. Most patients will settle with a single aspiration with antibiotics, but if they don't, we may repeat the antibiotic, uh, repeat the ultrasound and an aspiration as needed. Remember, IND is only done in very selected situations. It's not common practice to do an IND uh, for a breast abscess, especially if the patient is lactating. Uh, moving on to G infection. Sorry, there's a mistake with the slides. Uh, Epidemiochitis is again a common situation or a common presentation to first contact doctors. So the presentation and the underlying pathophysiology depends on the age group. If it's a young patient, you should always suspect a sexually transmitted infection. Uh, if it's an old patient, you have to suspect prostatism, but that does not mean that they cannot develop or get an STI. So the antibiotics you use depend on the mechanism that you suspect. So generally in the young, you treat them with doxycycline, with or without ciprofloxacin, and in the elderly or the older population, you can treat them with ciprofloxacin alone. It's very important that you don't miss a torsion of a testis and treat one as epidemiochitis. Always, again, like I've said earlier, err uh, on the side of caution. If you cannot make a conclusive diagnosis, please refer them to a surgeon. Uh, I'm seeing a few questions in the chat and I will take them up at the end. Uh, prostatitis, how do you diagnose it? Well, if a male comes to you, if the patient has a history of, the patient may have a history of benign prostatic enlargement, they may complain of deep pelvic pain, there may or may not be dysuria, the patient has fever, and when you do a digital rectal examination, there's definite tenderness with the prostate, then you can suspect prostatitis. You may be able to confirm this with a urine culture, but remember a normal urine culture does not exclude prostatitis. So in patients who come to me with prostatitis, in addition to the antibiotics, so the antibiotic of choice here, uh, I'll talk about the antibiotics in a bit. So, in addition to the antibiotics, you need to give them pain relief. Paracetamol or ibuprofen or any NSAID. Remember, it's inflammatory type of pain. So NSAIDs are going to be very useful. You also advise them on drinking enough water to avoid dehydration. Also tell the patient that prostatitis is one of those infections that take some time to resettle. So the usual course is going to take several weeks of antibiotics. Generally, we use ciprofloxacin or a single antibiotic, so there are no adverse effects, but if you're using something unusual, warn them about the side effects. And like all, my, all the situations I mentioned earlier, advise them on seeking medical advice. If the symptoms worsen, don't start to improve or be, if they become very unwell. So the first choice of antibiotics, it will be ciprofloxacin or ofloxacin. If this is unsuitable, you can use cortramoxazole. Second choice is levofloxacin. But if the patient is severely unwell, 
they need IV antibiotics. And it's not uncommon for patients to be severe, very unwell with prostatitis. So it will be the same antibiotics or even gentamicin for these patients. So coming to the end of my talk, all of the previous uh, slides were about infections and antibiotics. And there are some general rules when you prescribe an antibiotic. First of all, think about the side effects. Patients hate the GI side effects of erythromycin. And unless you tell them beforehand, and better if you avoid them by using a different antibiotic, the patient is going to have very poor compliance. Similarly, a reasonable number of patients will get diarrhea with comoxiclap and they may stop it thinking it's an allergic reaction or stop it because of the side effect. So always consider the side effect or side effects of your antibiotic treatment and warn the patients about the antibiotics or the side effects. The second thing is about how can you improve compliance. Multiple studies worldwide have looked at the factors that improve or worse in compliance when it comes to antibiotics. And a few things come, come up regularly. Use a short, the shortest duration you can and use an antibiotic with a shorter duration. Use antibiotics with fever doses a day. Remember, an antibiotic like fluoxetine. or... Remember, an antibiotic that requires an administration four times a day, like cloxacillin, is going to have worse compliance than something that patient takes thrice a day, like coamoxiclab. Something you can give twice a day, like Cipro, or once a day, like moxifloxacin, are going to have far is going to have far better compliance, simply because it's simpler to take. And always explain what you're giving, why you're giving, and the side effects. Always be cognizant about the cost. Cloxacillin is probably the cheapest one you can use. Fluoxacillin is considerably, considerably more expensive. And same goes to other antibiotics. So especially in somebody who are trying to treat for several weeks, remember that cost is going to be a factor that will affect your compliance. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. I think I'll finish exactly on time. Uh, I see a few questions on the chat. Uh, so let's take it from the top. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask live or put it in the chat and I will take it. Uh, somebody has asked about nail oncomycosis. That's a very difficult condition to treat. Uh, the first thing I do when I see a patient with oncomycosis is refer the patient to a dermatologist to make sure it's not one of those dermatological things that I'm missing. So I would give you the same advice. If you see or if you're suspecting nail infections, especially fungal infections, which have no acute infection, refer them to a dermatologist. Uh, there's a question about laparoscopic surgery for appendicular abscess or open surgery. Well, rule of thumb, if there's an appendicular abscess, if the patient is well, that patient can be managed with antibiotics and we don't do any surgery. If the patient is becoming unwell, we might try to do an ultrasound guided aspiration of the abscess. Again, we try to avoid surgery in that phase. If, remember these are localized abscesses. If the patient has peritonitis or four quadrant abscess, then that's an indication for surgery. It depends on the facilities available and the competency of the surgeon and the, what the surgeon fears safe to do. Laparoscopic surgery is actually useful because you can do a well visualized abscess uh, washout, including suction and irrigation. So it's not uh, an abscess or uh, appendicular abscess is not a contraindication for laparoscopic uh, surgery, but it depends on what the surgeon is uh, com uh, comfortable with. Uh, there's a question about epidemiochitis, whether it can lead to infertility. Recurrent episodes or, or a long 
standing uh, episode of epidermophytes can lead to infertility, especially if it's bilateral. Remember, a unilateral problem, assuming the opposite or the contralateral test is, is normal, is not going to cause uh, subfertility or infertility in a healthy adult. Uh, how do you differentiate nail infections with bacteria or fungi? Uh, generally, bacterial infection, bacteria don't generally infect the nail. You're getting a nail fold, a paranoia or epinoia. So if it's an acute infection, it's generally going to be a bacterial infection. Uh, chronic infections with nail deformity are going to be more likely fungal, but you can always have a superadded bacterial infection in a patient who's had a long-standing fungal infection. Uh, Home remedies for breast abscess and lactating mothers. Well, the most important thing, I don't know whether you can consider it a home remedy, is that the is that the lactating mother needs to either lactate or express milk from that breast. You cannot let milk accumulate in that breast because that is going to worsen the infection. Warm compressors may help, but it may worsen the pain. So it up it's up to the patient to choose with uh, what they use. Uh, that's all the questions I can see in the chat. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question live, uh, you can have a chance. I can see Nilesh has uh, put uh, a contact number. So for recordings and all purposes or regarding this, please uh, send your email address and uh, Nilesh and his team will get back to you. Epidermochitis and filariasis, yes, uh, filariasis can cause epidermochitis. It's fortunately, filariasis is fortunately not that common. I, I would say it's very uncommon these days. But if you have a patient who has epidermochitis of a subacute cause, always sus suspect filariasis and treat after doing the appropriate investigations. Uh, I don't see any further questions. Uh, Nilesh, do you want to say anything? Have we discussed about the uh, H. pylori? So, okay. So, I, H. pylori, first of all, like I said, uh, yes, uh, I think uh, all the questions have been wrapped up. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Since there was a question on H. pylori, I'll take it. So, first thing to know about H. pylori is when to suspect it and when to test it. General recommendation is if you have intractable peptic ulcer disease or a maltoma, uh, that's the time to check by H. pylori. The tests you can do uh, depend on what uh, generally in Sri Lanka. H. pylori testing is done uh, on endoscopic biopsies. We do a chlor test, or campylobacter-like organism test, uh, or a rapid urea, or a ureus test. The other options are uh, breath tests for, for ureus or uh, stool antigen testing, which are not widespread. So we don't use that. So if you suspect H. pylori right, for in a patient because they have intractable uh, dyspepsia or if you suspect peptic ulcers, refer them, we'll do an endoscopy. Then it depends on the diagnosis. If it's confirmed, yes, you can start treatment. But even in the absence of confirmation, it's the endoscopically, if you have evidence, you can start because the uh, testing is not routinely available. Uh, it's always going to be a PPI and two antibiotics. The antibiotic choice depends on the cost as well as local uh, resistant guidelines. But routinely, we use uh, a PPI like omeprazole. Uh, antibiotic is always going to be amoxicillin combined with either clarithromycin or metronidazole. Uh, clarithromycin has a pharmacokinetic advantage. It prolongs the half-life of amoxicillin. So we prefer to use 
uh, clarithromycin based uh, antibiotics than metronidazole. But if the patient cannot tolerate clarithromycin, it's safe to use uh, metronidazole. Uh, I can see somebody has put their hand up. Is that a question? A comment or, okay, maybe it's a mistake. Sorry, it's is a mistake. Very sorry. Yeah. sorry. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Is there any questions? We can switch on your yeah. mic also. Uh, there any questions? Please. I think your hand, you put the hand up. I'm receiving the contact numbers and the emails. Definitely, I will share you the recordings and uh, I will forward you up the uh, future updates as well. Okay. Is there any question more to ask? Uh, my email address is always, uh, my, I put my email address there. So if you have any questions uh, regarding to this or any similar topic that you would like to get advice, uh, please feel free to contact me on my official email. Uh, and uh, put the link of my uh, patient education channels. And, uh, you, you're free to use them for patient education purposes as well. Uh, I don't think there are any further questions, Nilesh. So over to you. Uh, 